Um, so when I got in last night, I am surf, couch surfing with an old friend from college, and I told him I was going to an, inter- an Internet of Things conference. And the first thing that he asked was, uh, while you're there, can you come up with a better name? <laughs> Are we stuck with the name The Internet of Things? So we, we actually talked about it for a little bit and thought, what are some other names that would make sense for IoT? Uh, and ubiquitous computing is one that I'm, I'm fond of. We dug into the thesaurus and said, what if we looked for alternatives? What if it's not ubiquitous? What if we look for some of the other meanings that, that could fit in with that? So this is a fast scroll through the thesaurus of other things that mean ubiquitous. Um, and a lot of these are actually pretty good fits for one piece or another of this big assembly that we call IoT. Um, Some of them are a little creepy. Some inescapable computing, right, is a little bit creepy. Some of them feel very powerful. Some of them feel more human. Uh, I think there's an interesting discussion to be had about what we want IoT to look like, right? Which of these values actually should come through? And I'm going to make the case that we should really be human-centric. And one of the things that I've loved about the conference so far is I hear a lot of other people saying that, and it's not a thing that I was hearing as much six months ago. I, I think uh, the conversation is moving on, on what IoT needs to be. So one set of values. We can talk about ubiquitous as everywhere, panoramic, universal computing. It's just it's everywhere. Uh, there's another one. This is kind of how I feel about my cell phone. It's incessant. It's inescapable. It's continual. You're kind of trapped there just a little bit. Um, And then another, I'm not totally satisfied with any of these words, but um, the idea that we can take familiar objects and make them computational things, make them smart, make them connected, take things that are habitual, that are already part of our day-to-day lives, so everyday computing. I, I think those are all interesting and compelling visions for what what could replace this terrible phrase, the IoT. Okay. I want to spend most of my time talk, basically following Nigel's format from this morning, taking a few kind of big picture, fairly abstract ideas for how to do that, and then giving specific examples and trying to pull out some principles. So the first one that I, I think is old news here is play nice with humans. It's not just about machine-to-machine connection. It's not just about protocols um, or, or connectivity. In just about every Internet of Things system that we're going to build, there will be people involved. They'll be controlling it, replacing it, interacting with it on a day-to-day level. And if we don't get get the play nice with humans part right, then the the thing as a whole won't work. You might not know that if you look at infographics on the web. So here is the Internet of Things. Find the people. Go. There's one little pawn guy up at the top. There's another guy who's kind of running away out of the bottom corner. And then there's sort of a corporate dude up in the top center. Those are the people. Everything else is gadgets and gears and airplanes. Uh, Not not very human. Here's another one. Same thing. There's a construction worker in the top. He's the only human in this picture. Uh, We do have a heart, but we don't have the rest of the body there. Um, And then this one is just a little bit creepy to me. There's this wonderful city of the future that no longer contains any people. right? Um, So... Yeah, the, this kind of meme is out there about machine to machine and, and it's all going to be automated and people are going to go away. That, that feels a little bit weird and frightening. And, um, and more to the point, if we approach systems this way, just not bothering to have people as part of the picture, then we're not going to design for real people. A couple examples. Uh, wearables. So it sounds cool to put a computer on your body. When you actually get into the mechanics of that, it's really complicated and difficult to do. So these are um, stills from a bunch of stretching tests and waterproof tests and shock tests that Jawbone has to do that uh, to make your up band work. Those are not things that you have to do with a desktop computer or a mainframe. But if you want to live on people's bodies and not give them skin rashes and not break when somebody sits on it, then you need to do all these things. It's more complicated. Um, Here's another example, and I I think we may have a speaker talking about this later this afternoon. This is Baxter, an industrial robot. I'm going to do witness protection here and cover up his face. And when you look at it this way, this looks like an industrial robot, right? This, it has arms, it's actuating stuff. Um, That's more what we're used to. The addition of a face here is, I I think, a really interesting user experience. 
um, and it's interesting because it means that you can have robots and people co-working together. They don't have to be siloed off with the heavy industrial stuff in one part of the factory and people in the safe, cushy other part of the factory. You can work side by side together. That opens up lots and lots of possibilities. Um, here's a, a quick scan of, of what Baxter's face means. So just different approaches, d- different ways of signaling what the robot is doing. And you could have that on a dashboard, or you could have little blinking LEDs, but this very simple face communicates that much, 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 much better. Um, we saw a similar thing this morning with Jibo, right, using very human, very emotive expressions with only one eye, which I'm still getting used to, but um, it still has a, a kind of a face, and we, we relate to that much, much more naturally. Okay, so play nice with humans. Second, second point is go right to the point of decision. And I think this is an opportunity that we have with IoT uh, that we haven't seen very much of just yet. We're starting to see examples, but, but there, I think, is a lot more that could be done here. So in traditional computing, you interact with everything through a screen. So you, you have to go to your laptop, sit down, open it up, and, and deal with it there. Or maybe pull out your phone, but your phone probably doesn't know exactly where you are. It's not super context- contextually aware yet. Now we can start going precisely to the point of decision. So... Um, let, me, let me tell you a quick story about Ambient Orb. Who knows Ambient, by the way? We're in Boston, close to MIT. Oh, I'm, I'm disappointed. This is kind of proud, connected device history. You should know this. Um, the Ambient Orb is a crystal ball that can light up in different colors. It came out in, I think, 2006. And the idea was to have a glanceable ambient information portal. So you can tune it to follow the stock market or to follow the weather or traffic, whatever is important to you. And I first ran across Ambient Orb in grad school where I read a case study from a California electricity market. So the challenge is they're trying to save power by getting people to run heavy use appliances later at night. So run your dryer after 8 p.m. because it's cheaper to generate power then, it's more environmentally friendly, and power companies can actually pass those savings on to consumers. So when, this, uh, when these programs first rolled out, the power companies were sharing tens of dollars per month with consumers to run their heavy appliances during off-peak hours. And the economists said demand curves slope down, you stand to save money, so of course people are going to shift their behavior. And I think any good designer or psychologist looking at this would say, behavior change is a really, really hard problem. It's, it costs much more than $20 to change your behavior. So, like, $20 in mental effort. And so people aren't going to change. And the psychologist won. Um, in month after month, survey after survey, people said, oh, I mean to change my behavior. I mean to run my appliances later. But I, I just forget, you know? It's, it's my dryer. I don't spend most of my life thinking about my dryer. So they tried to email, they tried text messages, they tried addressing this problem in a lot of ways. And finally, one of the managers of the programs got fed up, bought 120 ambient orbs, and tuned them so that they would glow red during the day, stop, don't run your appliances now, and green late at night. So there's no, uh, they're not cutting off the power, there's no coercion here. It's just a gentle little nudge. And he told people, put it wherever you can see it. Put it wherever you're making that decision. So people put them on their counters, on their tables, on their desks. And for people in that group, power consumption immediately dropped by 40% during the day and stayed there month over month. Um, it's like a big, miraculous change in behavior, one, one of the best case studies I know there. So taking data, taking even really simple information right to the point of decision is very, very powerful. Uh, other examples, just, just to put these on your radar. Oh, you know about these, but to, to sketch the pattern. Uber is putting basically the world's cheapest heads-up display in taxis all over the world, right? Or they're not taxis. They're, they're tech companies, so you can't regulate them like taxis. But um, at the point of decision. So when Uber's app says turn left, you turn left. It's right there, right in the moment. Lumo Lift? Who, who knows Lumo? So Lumo is a posture-correcting wearable. You... Uh, train it a little bit to tell it when you're slouching and when you're standing up straight. And then you, you put it on your clothes, and it, it buzzes you to tell you, um, hey, sit up straight. So it creates this new decision point to, to sit up straight. Another one that I think is brilliant and maybe evil is the Amazon Dash button. So reorder your Huggies or your Tide, and it can go right on your washing machine or right at the changing table. Amazon is giving these away for free because they 
Partly, I think it's a behavior study, but I, I think there's also pretty compelling reason to believe that they'll get people to order a little bit more. They're getting Tide's brand right on your washing machine, best possible place for advertising. And so um, in, a, in a very monetary way, I think these are going to pay off. So go to the point of decision. Practically speaking, I, I think one way you can think about this is that in the past, analytics mostly focused on big decisions, strategic decisions, the kind of thing where you would have a team write a memo and then bring it back to the executive team and, and do a PowerPoint. And so you, in the vast majority of the decisions that we're making day to day, they're at the bottom of the pyramid. They're just not worth that much attention, and so you can't address them. Now, all of a sudden, we're in a place where you can take decisions like re reordering detergent or turning left or sitting up straight, and those are addressable because not just, uh, not just sensors but uh, nudges and reminders can go right to where you're living. Okay, last point on this, and this is a little bit of a, a pet for me. It's, yeah, I, I guess as a data scientist, I had to bring in math sooner or later. So in tech, uh, insight is a function of context conditional on intent. And, and what I mean by that is the Internet of Things is putting sensors everywhere. And that's cool because we have more data. And it's also really a pain because we have lots and lots more data. So uh, my first major uh, not freelance data science job was at Jawbone as a data scientist. And these fitness trackers produce a ton of data, a ton of data. And feeding that back to people in a way that makes sense and is intuitive and actually actionable um, is a problem in and of itself. It, it's simply not that interesting to show people, here are all the steps that you took last week. You have to start to boil that up to things that mean something. So my, my mental picture for this is we've got a billion signals coming in, and they're complicated, and they're overlapping, and they're all, they're all over the place. Once you understand intent, once you understand the decisions that people care about and where they make them and how they make them, then you have the lens to boil that down and focus just on the one or two pieces of data that, that really matter. It's a tricky place because you don't always know in advance what the important questions are going to be. So you kind of have to store everything to start off with. And, and I know that raises privacy questions. Um, but when the time comes to focus on a specific application, you also need an efficient system to zero in on that thing. So a few examples here. Ringly, show of hands, who's? OK. If anybody's using this, I'd, I'd love to hear reviews. I've had a couple friends who've, who've started using it, and the reviews are kind of mixed. But Ringly is a smart ring, and the idea is it is it's basically a filtering system. So all of the text messages and all the notifications that you get on your phone, and you're, if you're like most people, you get your phone out about 100 times a day, and you probably get 60 or 80 notifications per day. Um, I, actually, I suspect in this room it's more, because <laughs> uh, we're a pretty tech-friendly audience. Um, Ringly takes those notifications and decides which of them are worth getting a notification on your finger for. So, for example, one of their use cases is um, you are out with your husband to go see a play. And at that point, you really don't want any messages from work, and you don't want to hear about um, the latest deal that's, that's coming through Amazon Local. The only thing you really care about there is if you get a medical, a medical emergency or something from the babysitter. So Ringly is part hardware, but also part filtering system, where it needs to understand the context of what you're doing right now to decide which messages are relevant and which worth pushing to your finger. Uh, we, we talked about Apple Watch a little bit before. I, I suspect that they're going to have trouble with this because I, I th my sense is we're already kind of overloaded with notifications on your phone, and iWatch is doubling down on that. It's now putting a screen on your wrist in a place where it's even harder to ignore and you're going to get even more traffic. So personally, I really don't want to know about every new Twitter follower I have. It would drive me nuts if that was on my wrist. And so I, I think Apple is going to have to think very hard about how they make developers happy but also and have good guarantees about what sorts of messages are delivered. But don't, don't inundate people with way too much data. Um, we, we can skip this one. This is what the Napa Valley earthquake looks like from the perspective of sleep data. So when, when there's an earthquake in Napa Valley, people wake up. You, you can actually map the epicenter by looking at where people woke up at, at that point. OK. Um, let me wrap up. 
ubiquitous, com ubiquitous computing brings together lots of different values. I, I think we're still defining what that means, and there are a lot of interesting conversations around that. Uh, from the perspective of using data and, and hardware to do new things, to, to make insights more actionable, you need to play nice with humans. You can get a lot done if you go straight to the point of decision. And context, conditional on intent, equals insight. So, thank you. <laughs>